Welcome, everybody. Hey, hey. Work smarter where you want. This is learning at its most fun. All right, welcome everybody to another Red Tail Practice Management webinar. We're really excited to have you here today. Before we get started, I wanna remind everybody, like I always like to, to mention, our practice management webinars are designed not to give you CRM specific training, not to give you red tail training, but to really give you some best practices, some, some practices that you might not be thinking about, some different ways of thinking about how you are running your practice, regardless of whether you're using red tail or any type of technology. It's all about a strategic focus and all about focusing on that practice management. So if you're looking for CRM training, take the opportunity to check out all of the many hours of CRM specific training that we have on our help desk, on our YouTube channel, reach out to our trainers for a one-on-one. -on -one. But today, we are going to be doing practice management focus training, talking about those strategies. And with us today, we have Derek Notman uh, from Connector. Derek, I've been working with Derek for actually a fairly short amount of time. But for that short amount of time, I've actually really liked uh, working with him. We've really jived and connected on a lot of strategies. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him and to have him on today's webinar. He's been in the financial services industry since 2006. He started his own firm with just three years of experience. And, and that's pretty impressive. I love his philosophy. His philosophy is do what is right for his clients and eventually he will get paid. And I love that. It's putting what is right by your clients first. If you do what is right by your clients, then it will come back to you in getting paid, in getting taken care of and compensated, but the clients come first. Uh, in 2013, he transitioned his practice to a virtual model. And he did that to save his clients time, save them money, and give himself a better work-life balance. And that change has allowed him to pursue more passion, spend more time with his family without sacrificing the services that he's able to provide to his clients. Uh, he, and he did that <laughs> seven years ago. He did that before any of us might have even been thinking about doing uh, virtual models. Derek's the founder of Connector, a technology company focused on serving financial advisors on a global scale. And like I said, I love that Derek has been operating in this particular space with this particular virtual mindset that is so very obviously important right now this year and, and for the years to come. Uh, so not only has he put together a valuable and successful virtual business model, not only has he been helping advisors put together their own virtual models, but he's been doing it, like I said, for the past several years. While I have personally seen many struggle this year, you know, to catch up in these past months that, that we've been kind of forced to make changes. So I love that he has that mindset. I, I, I watched his presentation during the uh, Riskalyze virtual fearless week. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm really happy to have him here today. So Derek, with all of that being said, my man, the floor is yours. Take it away. <laughs> thank you very much, Rick. I appreciate that very kind introduction. Uh, everyone else, thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. It is greatly appreciated. I know how busy everyone can be, and for you to carve out some time for us uh, is very generous. So thank you. Uh, excited to get into this today. And as Rick said, we're going to go through uh, some really cool uh, strategies, tactics, ideas, things that you can think of for your practice. Um, and then we definitely want to reserve some time for some Q&A at the end. Uh, so feel free to drop those questions as Rick suggested. And uh, Rick, at any time, if there's a question that you think fits, please interrupt me and we'll, we'll jump right in and talk about it as we're going. Okay. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll jump in here. And just so you all know, uh, those of you who saw Rick's presentation at Riskalyze, uh, arguably the best presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> Uh, was an inspiration for how I'm going to do mine today. So yes, I am copying him a little bit, <laughs> but uh, that's a, you know that's a, what a compliment, as they say. Um, so hopefully we can you know hold a little bit of a candle towards what he did. Anyways, we'll, we'll jump in. Thanks again for everybody you know being here today, and I hope you get a lot of value out of this. Okay, so let's start with this little blip right here. Because it's real. How can I know that, Mr. Shen? Well, how? Yes, how? Uh, help me out here. Please, how? Huh. 
See? There was nothing. But that's how it always begins. Very small. Love that movie, and we'll see a few more clips as we go through here. But basically what we're going to talk about today is the dark and stormy night for financial services. You know, what COVID has done to our industry this year. And there are some silver linings, I will tell you. Um, how we react. We have to talk about our reactions to the environment that we're in, not only for just getting by tomorrow, but what does the future of this industry look like? And how are we going to react to that? I'll talk a little bit more about me. I think Rick did a great job introducing me, so I'll give you a couple little bit more tidbits on who I am. Uh, we won't have to spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, we're going to talk about how practice management used to be thought of and, and done. Um, you know, even though I only started in 2006, I was taught a lot of things that were done for many, many decades before that. So it'll be interesting. We'll talk about where things used to be from a practice management standpoint. And then we'll talk about practice management today and how things have evolved and look and how things should be done differently. Um, we're going to get into some specifics. I've got a nice hit list of things that I will elaborate on, things that you can walk away with today uh, that you should be thinking about as far as practice management comes to your actual business. Uh, a little bit about what Connector is doing to empower advisors. Uh, we do get questions about that, so I just want to be clear what Connector is and what it does. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then we'll do a live Q&A for everybody. So we can just pop in any questions that you have and uh, you know, we'll go through them as best that we can. Um, and as Rick may or may not have mentioned, we will definitely be following up with a replay. And then uh, also I will be sending all of you a copy of this slide deck uh, and my, just my contact information. So you'll have all of that later. Okay, so let's jump in here to the first bit. Just listen to the old pork chop express and take his advice on a dark and stormy night, all right? When some wild eyed eight foot tall maniac grabs your neck, taps the back of your favorite head up against a barroom wall, and he looks at crooked in the eye and he asks you if you've paid your dues. Well, you just stare that big sucker right back in the eye, and you remember what old Jack Burton always says at a time like that. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir, the check is in the mail. So love that movie. Again, if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's one of actually one of his first movies ever done. So pretty cool. So we're in, in the midst of a transformation of our industry, the financial services industry. And as you all are aware of, this is an old, old industry. We've been around for a long time. We don't tend to evolve or pivot very quickly unless absolutely forced to. And if there is some silver lining to what's happening this year, I would argue that the evolution of our industry, of, of how we practice, how we, how we do everything that we do has actually been sped up and that's a good thing. You know, we, we are in the midst of what is you know, referred to as a mega trend. And if you don't know what a mega trend is, although this is a great uh, quote here that really sums it up nicely, go Google it and take a look. But we were in the midst of this global trend, this global mega trend before COVID was even a thing. So we've been around for some time now where things have been evolving. And I think a lot of our industry just didn't recognize it. And that's one, again, one of the silver linings is, is that COVID, although it's been a, a definitely a dark and stormy year for, uh, for our industry, especially, I think COVID definitely brought to light how behind we were, but has also helped us exponentially speed up so we can actually change to be what we need to be. Um, we are not in 1985 anymore. And some of you have maybe heard me talk about this before, but things are done differently. The way that we interact with clients, the way that we you know, provide our services and so forth, this, everything has evolved. So we have to make sure that we are, are thinking about that. And a quick tangent, when I was started in 2006, I was being taught the strategies that had been around for the last you know, 20, 30 years from 1985 and so forth. And I was asking a dear friend of mine who actually started in the industry in 1985. And he was laughing about me telling him this because he said when he started, he had, was taught the exact same things from guys who had been doing it since the 50s. So this has been around for a long time. So I, again, it just shows that like, we have to transform, we have to evolve. We, are, we can't be stuck in the past anymore. What's interesting with the megatrend is that human behavior changes. 
it materially changes. Now, will we ever um, go back to the way we were 100%? No. Will we kind of as a rubber band kind of snap back a little bit? Yes, we will, but human behavior has actually changed. And with that, we have evolution. We have evolution of technology, which has happened for some time now. So with everything that's been changing, advisors really must embrace, must acknowledge that these things have happened. We can't stick our head in the sand anymore and just hope things are going to get better at some point. You know, things have changed and we have to say, okay, I get it. They have, what are we going to do differently? You know, and most of us, including myself, we all ran our business uh, the old way. We've all worked, you know, done the cold calling, had the brick and mortar. A lot of us uh, still do. So just as Jack Burton says, you know, we've, we've paid our dues. We've been there. So I think now it's time for us to say, okay, I've been through the, the ringer. It's time for us to evolve and look at doing things differently, not only for our benefit, but for our clients' benefits. Okay, so I think reaction here is extremely important. So let's talk, let's just see what good old Jack Burton has to say about reaction. You're out of your mind, Wang. God bless you. <laughs> It's all in the reflexes. Wait. <laughs> Love that scene. So, as I said, what people want has changed. How they want it, what they want has actually changed. And we have to be aware of that, right? How people are getting their information, their services, all of that has changed. But let's think about it. We, we have Amazon now. We can get everything from Amazon. My wife has something dropped off from Amazon, I think, daily. Um, <laughs> You know, we can do our groceries online, we do our dating online, we do our banking online. So how and what people want definitely has evolved over the last 20 years as we've been in this mega trend that we've been in. So people are gonna go to a source that they trust one way or another, and if they can't find it at one place, then they're just gonna go to the next thing. And that's where the, the internet really has this, been this great equalizer where those that are willing to be the source of trust information, boy, they can just grow exponentially, but it also can really just make the ones that aren't, aren't willing to provide the information and be that trusted source kind of just be left to history. It's kind of a double-edged sword, if you will. Um, so how do we react to these, these facts is really a choice. We, we can't argue with the data. Uh, and some of, you, some of you may know that there was a study produced by McKinsey and Company international study that came out in 2019, pre-COVID. COVID wasn't even on the radar when this study came out. And at that time, they had already determined that over 42 million households were prime candidates for virtual advice, and that people were already looking for that type of engagement. So we have to acknowledge like the, these things, this mega trend, what people want, how they want it has been there. So we have to actually react. Jack Burton didn't have to catch that bottle. So it's, it's all a choice, right, and how we react to what's going on right in front of us. So one of the things we have to be concerned or worried about is with this reaction, are we gonna lose clients to advisors that are reacting faster or just better than we are? If we choose not to react, that's still a reaction. It's just not the one that's gonna get us the types of results that we want. So we have to think about that. You know, we are in a competitive space. And I would, I would argue that we all are on the same team. There's enough business out there for us all to be very successful. But if, uh, if we're going to gather those clients, if we're going to grow our businesses, we are going to have to be the ones that actually react quickly so we can adapt and evolve to what's going on around us. All right, so who's a little bit more about this guy? All right, so yeah, I've been in the industry since 2006. I made the transition to being virtual in 2013 due to a number of reasons. I've told the story a number of times, so you can find it out there on a number of podcasts. But it was a really, really great transition to make looking back. Uh, it has allowed me to live such an awesome life, grow my business exponentially, reduce my overhead. It was really a great choice. And the picture here with me on, on the lounger, that's working uh, in a, a remote part of South Africa where we actually had to fly in via helicopter, right? I mean, really in the middle of nowhere. So I was still able to go enjoy a great trip with my family, but also run my business. Um, I also uh, started Connector, as you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, happily married and have a, uh, a nine-year-old son who's going on 16. 
Um, love to travel around the world. I've been working on my surfing a lot this year, actually. I'm finally starting to do all right. And uh, I love cars. So a little bit about me, we can skip past that. If you want to talk more shop about me or my passions in life, hit me up with a message. So this is kind of fun. These are some old pictures. Um, this is practice management from the past. This is how things used to be run. Uh, the picture on the top left there, the ribbon cutting ceremony, that was my business partner and I at the time. We were all in on doing things the traditional way, the model from 1985, if you will. We bought an office building on Main Street in the town we lived, spent months rehab, it hadn't been touched since the 70s, so it needed a ton of work. So we did all that. We had multiple in-house staff. We had the old clunky computers and everything was on a yellow pad. You can see the, uh, the filing cabinets there, you know, tons and tons of paper. Everywhere you look, there's paper. So that's how, I mean, I used to run things. I think a lot of us have probably done the same thing. This is how things were just, have been done for so long. We were dependent on a physical office space, whether it was part of a larger office where we shared space with a number of other advisors or we opened up our own shop. We just assumed that, hey, you're supposed to have a physical office. Uh, that was just how practice management went. Like, you're, you need to have this. Otherwise, how, how are clients going to see you? Uh, we had to have in-house staff, secretary, executive assistant, reception, marketing, service, para planners, you name it, all of these in-house staff. Um, and we've all had those to certain degrees. I've had multiple in-house staff at one time while I had that office, and I'll tell you, it's not as great as it seems. <laughs> Some of you could probably appreciate that, but there's a lot more headache and expense that comes with it than people may realize. Everything is paper, paper applications, paper files, paper notes. Everything was paper, 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 and we had to have a place to store all of that stuff. It was disjointed, really. The systems can't talk to each other. A filing cabinet can't talk to your computer can't talk to your CRM and so forth, right? It was all very disjointed and not, not an efficient way to run a business at all. Yellow pad data gathering, I think some of us are still um, subject to this today, but that's our fact finder, right? That's how we're taking notes, that's what we're doing, that's how we're trying to gather our data. And I think that's shifted a bit, but that's how things were done. Yeah, it's still happening for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, Rick, I, I uh, I coach, mentor, talk to a lot of advisors, and I, I hear it today, like even young ones, I'll, I'll take a quick tangent here, but a younger advisor who just started um, with a well-known national bank channel uh, this year, within a few, you know, right when he started, the senior people at that office said, okay, here's a list of the local chamber of commerce. Uh, we want you to start go cold calling them. Um, you know, start doing in-person meetings with them. And he's like, but we've got this pandemic. How am I supposed to do all this? You know, wh where's our online fact finders? Where's our note, you know, all this stuff. So it's still being taught today. And I, I, I say that with beta breath a little bit just because it is frustrating, but it also is understandable because the people teaching the younger advisors coming up learn things differently. They learn the model from 1985 that worked really, really well during that time period. And that's the kind of the mode that they're stuck in, if you will. So it's a challenge for this younger generation of advisors. Anyways, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole too much. <laughs> um, so yeah, cold calling. I, oh, we had phone clinics every week, doing seminars, walking around, you know, literally cold calling on businesses, walking in, hey, I was in the neighborhood, you know, and networking events and all that stuff. That, that's what we did. That was just part of how our practice was supposed to be run. Lots of windshield time. I can't tell you how many miles and hours I spend in the car driving to appointments. Some of them getting porched. I'm sure you remember, some of you remember that term, but getting porched was not fun. Um, so this is just, again, one of those things that's just so inefficient, so disjointed, so old school. And for so long, we had to do things this way, but we don't have to do them this way anymore. Also, I found it was really product centric. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not going to go down that whole other path today, but I think we really need to focus more on planning centric. So product centric was a challenge, but I think it was partially a byproduct of just how disjointed this model was. This is an expensive model. It's a stressful model. So yeah, we need to make money to make it run. High overhead. 
it is expensive to run an office. It is expensive to have staff and to pay for benefits. All of these things add up really, really quickly. And they're necessary if you're gonna you know, find any type of success with that old model. So I would say, I mean, overall here, you guys can see, this is the way that things were done for so long. And I would say probably a lot of people are still operating this way. I'm not saying it's bad. And I'm sure you can make some money doing it. But when we look at the data, when we look at the facts, when we look at the trends of what is happening in the world and what people want and how they want it, it's arguable, arguably you know, stated that this model just isn't going to work anymore. It's not going to work like it used to, at least all in on it. Let's talk a little bit more about what practice management today is going to look like. We've got this massive integration going on, right? So the financial advisor of the future is what I'm calling it. The future is today, by the way. The future is not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's not next year. Future's here, it's now, it's happening. We're here today. Um, we're gonna have location independence. We don't have to be physically tied to an office anymore. And it's been really cool. I was just talking to another advisor yesterday. She's been in the business for 20 years, had a brick and mortar office, had in-house staff. She's kicked all of it. She was able to break her lease. She let her staff go. And you know, she, she kind of went, went all in right away, but it's so cool because she saw the value in doing all this and she said, she, she actually is on blood pressure medication. She says since she's made the switch, her blood pressure has naturally gone down significantly. And she's so stoked about it. We outsource almost everything now these days from our staff to our CRM, to our financial planning, to, to our filing. So much of the things now can be outsourced. And it, it makes sense because as financial advisors, as planners, our job is to be an amazing planner. It's, it's to be able to sit down with our clients virtually or, or belly to belly and help them figure out what's important to them and put a plan together to help them get there. Our job is not to be a CRM master. Our job is not to be a marketing guru and all these other things. So why not outsource that stuff to the experts? Let them come in and provide the solutions for us. It's much more efficient and a fraction of the cost. We have a robust digital footprint. The cheesy seminar marketing, the, um, the door knocking, the cold calling, the advertising in the newspaper. I even once had a, a kiosk at a mall. Like, you know those mall like, kiosks where you can <laughs> buy like sunglasses or cell phone covers and stuff like that? I had a kiosk at a mall, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all day. Um, it didn't work, <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff that we used to do. So the advisor of the future, the way that they're building their practice now has this robust online presence. You may ask, well, why? Well, it's because where people are. The oldest trick in the book, marketing trick in the book is to go where people are and then be present. People aren't going to malls like they used to. People don't, aren't going to seminars like they used to. They are online, so we might as well be there. Uh, cutting edge tech stack. You can see here, here's just a sampling of the amazing tech that is out there now that we can customize based upon our personality, our practice, our styles. We're not having like a, you know, where we have to physically walk to our, our filing cabinet to get a file and then go get our yellow pad and then get a staff and then make a phone call just to do something for a client. We have massive integration now between all these different cutting edge tech stacks that we can use, which is awesome. You know, it's, it's pretty cool, too, because a lot of these tech have been around for some time. It's almost like they knew something the rest of us didn't because they got out there and started doing all of these things that we needed. And now we've got it at our fingertips at the time that we've needed it most in history. Paperless office, it's huge. I can't tell you what a weight off my shoulders it was to get rid of those filing cabinets and just be completely paperless. I haven't had a paper file in years. And boy, is that nice. Um, and then we're process and experience centric. I would argue that a lot of even the tech that we're able to use now kind of almost forces us to be more process centric. And again, we have to look at what clients want. Back in the day, if we were trying to sell a particular product at someone's house at night, the client kind of had to take a word for it. They couldn't just jump on their smartphone or, or you know, research us as easily. We're now with everything at their fingertips, they know that they should be getting proper planning and have an amazing experience in the process. So that's what they're looking for now as far as a practice management again standpoint is that client experience needs to be different. We're lean and mean. As I mentioned earlier, I reduced my overhead by at this point 61% from when I had that full office that I showed everybody. 
um, but my income has increased by 20% a year at the same rate. So we're lean, we're mean, we're able to pivot much more quickly. It's amazing what you can do by actually cutting the cord, so to speak, on so many of these things that we used to do. Right, so let's talk a little bit more about some specifics. Here's some actual things that every one of you need to take notes on and write down. Yes, you are gonna get a copy of this slide deck, but these are some things that you need to think about when you are trying to either build or evolve your practice given what's going on. So as I say here, Jack Burton is so much more than just a truck driver, and he really is. We joked about it. I mean, what is he? I think he's delivering eggs to Chinatown in San Francisco. I think that's what his job was. Um, but at the end of the day, look at all the other things that he had to do, whether it's just, you know, making sure his rig got there to actually dealing with all this, you know, Chinese magic and <laughs> all the other crazy things out there. And I think as advisors, we have to have that same mindset is that we, we are much more than just an advisor when it comes to running our practice. And I would argue, you know, I would ask you this question. Are you one of those planners that doesn't have a plan? Now you tell your clients to have plans, but that doesn't have a plan for your business and instead just throws money for or as a solution. You know, spending $20,000 on a website if you don't have a plan really doesn't make any sense. And we would never advise our clients to do X, Y, or Z as far as implementing something if it wasn't part of a plan and actually made sense. So I wanna give you some actionable tips and ideas today to help you guys start to build out your plan for your own business. So here's some components that I believe are necessary to run a successful practice today and moving forward. First, I would argue everyone needs to take a step back. Now I mentioned earlier, I have talked to hundreds and hundreds of advisors, and this is the step that I see missed most, is that the advisors tend to forget what their own personal hopes, dreams, and goals are. Another way to frame this is, is what is your why? Now this shouldn't take 20 minutes on a yellow pad. This is something that should take hours and hours. It should be a fun process. You should do it with your family. And part of this process is actually creating a vision board. Now I know that sounds a little hokey, but let me tell you, it works. Every advisor that I've helped that comes back to me and actually has done it, like they've even sent me pictures of their vision board. It's a game changer for them. So I would say everyone here, you're like actually spend some time with your family and write down what's important to you. What do you want outside of your business? Because if you do it correctly, I'll tell you right now, it actually drives a lot for your business. It helps you get crystallized on what your brand is, what your messaging is, what your digital marketing efforts are gonna be. It helps you define who your ideal client is. It really has a, a massive impact on all aspects of your business. So not doing it or doing a very poor job of it actually is gonna really hamstring the rest of your business if you, if you take my meaning. Uh, I, I did this myself and I, you know, I jumped in as an advisor and wasn't told any of this and just said, hey, you can make a lot of money, go sell this product. And I did. And then I woke up later. I'm like, you know, something really feels to be missing here. And although the money's good, it's not my main motivation. What else am I missing? What do I really need to do? And I'll tell you, as soon as you do this and get clear on it, your world will change for the better and your practice will as well. Physical infrastructure is another really important piece. So as I've said, I've talked to hundreds of advisors. Most of the time, I'm looking up their nose, the lighting's bad, um, I can tell they're on Wi-Fi, I can tell they're not using a high quality micro camera, uh, I can tell they're only running on one screen, I can't really hear them. And I'll tell you, like that is a real challenge if you're trying to work virtually or even semi-virtually. People want to have a great experience. And if we don't give them a great experience, they're gonna be suspect. Like, well, what's going on with these people? I can't hear them, this meeting's frustrating. I don't think I, I wanna work with them because it just feels off. So you have to provide an amazing, amazing experience for people in this virtual realm. And to do so, you have to have really awesome physical infrastructure. Everything from computers to monitors to webcams, everything, you name it. So everything sounds and looks awesome. Compliance. We don't want to skip compliance at all. And we all live under a compliance radar, if you will, and it's going to be different depending where we associate with. But I would argue, make them your best friend. Tell them what you're looking to do and how you're looking to do that. I had to do that. And there were a lot of challenges along the way, but having the open dialogue led to change. 
I was able to educate my compliance folks and show them what I wanted to do and how it was okay from a federal standpoint and was able to effect some really cool changes. The last thing you want to do is have them have to keep looking over your shoulder. So do everything the way that you're supposed to and get your compliance team on board, whether it's a digital marketing aspect or how to do e-applications, whatever it is that you're looking to do, have them on board and make sure that they understand what you're trying to do. Digital infrastructure, extremely important. Just having a website is great, but there's so much more to it. We have all of these different aspects of our digital infrastructure, our social media profiles, multiple ones, websites, there should be multiple ones, blogs, SEO, all the, the Google, um, Bing, and all these other, there's, there's all like Facebook pixels, all these technical aspects that have to be embedded into our digital footprint so we can not only get out and recognize, but then we can track our metrics so we know what's actually going on and we can determine what, are, what efforts are working well and which ones aren't. Really, really important because if you don't have a strong digital infrastructure, then your digital marketing efforts are going to be almost a waste of time and money because you need to drive people down this funnel. And if you don't have the correct funnel built, if you don't have the, the, ad, the digital assets where people can stock you and, and consume your content, then you're going to really, really struggle. So don't skip over this piece. And it needs to be a consistent message across all aspects of it. You need to define your ideal client. I mentioned this earlier about your own hopes, dreams, and goals. I was told early on, you have to niche, you have to have a specialty, you have to work with somebody, but no one ever told me how to do it. So it was always a frustration. So I ended up having a, a practice with a lot of clients all over the spectrum. And I had this revelation where once I, I got really clear on what I wanted in life, what, what my passions were and everything, it helped me get in tune with myself, but actually helped me get in tune with who my ideal client is. And it's amazing. It's a, it's a weight off your shoulders, and now you can go vet that ideal client. You can make sure you have critical mass with that ideal client. Your brand, your marketing, your messaging, everything can now be built around that ideal client. And it all starts with what your hopes, dreams, and goals are, who you are as an individual and what you want your whole life and practice to be. So don't skip this step. It's extremely important to be able to know who you want to work with, why you want to work with them, and make sure there's actually enough of them where you have critical mass. Digital marketing. Reference this with digital infrastructure. Digital marketing is extremely important, and I would argue whether you go virtual or not, you have to be great at digital marketing. Why? Because people are online. Billions of people are online. Google processes 3.5 billion searches a day, okay? So you can't argue with the facts and the numbers. I love math, we all love math. You can't argue with that. So people are online, so we have to go there and be present. We have to create content. Uh, some of you maybe heard me talk in the, in the past, don't be a creeper, be a creator. Creepers just sit out there and they never comment, they don't create content, they don't engage. And that's just weird, it's creepy. So part of your digital marketing efforts is, is you have to become this content creation machine where you're able to research what people, your ideal client, wants to know more about and then create content of value there that they can consume. But then also let people know a personal side of you. Who are you? What are you all about? Let people see into your life a little bit because honestly, people don't care how much you know, what your credentials are, how much you manage you know, in assets until they know who you are. They wanna know who you are, they wanna connect with you on a human level first, and your digital marketing efforts are a great, great way to be actually uh, to able to share that message. Trust and transparency. This is done through all of your marketing efforts, all your branding efforts, and everything. The work we do is extremely important, but there also is a lot of hesitancy about people working with us. Uh, there's a lot of mis-distrust in our industry for a number of reasons. We don't need to go down that path today. Um, but people are already leery of talking to us. So to help them to break through that barrier, we have to create a, a space and environment of trust and we have to be transparent about who we are, who we do it for, what we do, what we charge, all of these things give people all the information they need to make an educated decision. And we can do that before they actually ever even talk to us if done correctly. Have an awesome virtual sales process. So if you're gonna work even semi-virtually, 
then you need to have a virtual sales process. What does that look like? How many meetings are you gonna have? What do you cover in every meeting? What technology are you using to track all of that? How is it all baked in together? And this ties back into your marketing efforts, your physical infrastructure, all these other things are all tied together. So you have to have an awesome virtual sales process so people know what to expect and they go through this process feeling really good about what they're doing and what they're learning. Because at the end of the day, that's how they're gonna make a decision to work with you and implement the solutions that you're actually looking to, to provide for them. You have to consider your client's perspective as well. You know, are they sitting in their house, in their office, or it's a dog and kids running around? How are they feeling about things? What time zone are they in? What time of day is it? What is their physical infrastructure? Are they only running one screen? How is their webcam? We have to understand all of these things and put ourselves into their shoes so we can empathize with them, right? And then try to help them out through the tough times. Like I've had clients that were struggling with using their computer for a virtual meeting. So we have to be able to walk them through that. We have to be able to come up with alternative solutions on the fly as these things happen. So we really have to put ourselves in our client's shoes. Also from a marketing perspective, how are they feeling and in interpreting the messaging that we're sending out there? Are we sending the right message? Are we getting the right responses that we want? All things that you have to consider when you're thinking about what your client is looking for. Virtual staff. So my entire team, I have virtual reception team, I have a virtual executive administrator, virtual digital marketing, virtual para planner, virtual investment specialist. I have all of this stuff in place. I've actually only met one of them once. So there's a ton here we can do, and it's definitely possible, but you have to build it. You have to be meaningful. You have to identify who you need and what you need them to do. Now, for years, I was of the opinion I needed multiple in-house staff, and I needed them full time. And just that's what I thought. Everyone else did that, so why don't I do that? And what I found out to be is that there's actually a lot of waste that way. Um, by having a virtual team, you can be much more lean, much more efficient, and get a lot more done. And I've been doing it for years now, and the clients actually love it. Not to mention, if part of your team is overseas and are a much bigger time, time zone difference, they're working while you're sleeping. So your business is actually running faster and more than it would be if you just have people in house. Then you just have to live the virtual model. Uh, you have to understand, even if it's a semi-virtual practice, find balance. Don't let your calendar control you. You must control your calendar. Have calendar plugins so people can actually schedule meetings with you. You can embed these in a lot of different places, but control that calendar. Working virtually gives you a ton of freedom, but it also means you could work 18 hours a day because you're just sitting at home or wherever. So make sure that you are finding that balance that you are able to live the life that you want to live, work with the clients that you want to work with, and do the things that you're passionate about. And I would argue that running a practice in today's day and age with the technology available, the understanding of the consumer that, hey, virtual is okay, that we can actually get a lot more done in the same amount of time that we did before, and now have more time to be with our families and pursue our passions. So it's really important that you actually live the virtual model. That's not something you just talk about, but you actually live it and enjoy it, embrace it. Extremely important. Rick, do we have any questions about this while I'm just wrapping up this page? Well, there's, I mean, the, the, the one big one that, that I have that, that I think has been kind of asked a couple of times here is outsourcing right? How much of this do you outsource? Particularly somebody asked about outsourcing digital marketing. And in my opinion, and obviously, you know, you'll tell us how you do it. But in my opinion, like, almost everything can be quote unquote, outsourced in a way. Um, there are a number of digital uh, virtual marketing solutions out there right now compliant for this industry that help with that content creation that help personalize it, um, that help make it so that you can still focus on the things that you need to focus on as an advisor and give you that help in generating that content in that visibility and stuff like that. So I wanted to get your opinion on that in, in regards to, you know, quote unquote, outsourcing some of these things. Great point. So I'm a big fan of outsourcing. I love it. I outsource almost everything, but there are a couple pointers here and things that, that you should consider. One is you can never outsource yourself. And that's, so what do I mean by that? It's so important, especially from a digital marketing perspective. When I started this whole journey, I did all of my own digital marketing. 
and it was a bit of a time suck. It's, it's, it's work to create your own blog posts and your own social media posts and uh, you know, update website content and create eBooks and all this stuff. And at, I, at this point I do, I have a digital marketing team um, that does a lot for me at this point, but I didn't start off that way. And my advice is yes, go ahead and outsource it, but not yet. Don't start that way. And why is because you as the advisor, whether you're a single shop or you've got multiple advisors under a brand, doesn't really matter is you have to, to figure out what your voice or your persona is online. And the only way that's going to happen is if you actually start getting out there and posting content on social media, writing blog posts. And it's important for two reasons. One, it helps people get to know who you are because you can't fake it. And two, when you end up do getting an outsourced digital marketing solution, they can now go look at your content and say, ah, okay, I get who you are. I see what your writing style is all about, how you're interacting with people. So now they can go replicate that. Otherwise, if you just go straight, and this is what I talked about earlier, you know, are you just throwing money at something instead of as a solution instead of actually doing it? If you just go throw money to hire a digital marketing team because it's easier, what ends up happening is, is you get all this white label content that people can tell a mile away you didn't write it, uh, you didn't create it, it's canned, and maybe even multiple advisors are using the same thing. That's even worse when they're looking at that. So that's a real like off-putting example, you know, way to interact with clients or potential clients. So yeah, I love outsourcing, but don't do it initially, especially for digital marketing. Work up to that over time. And I'll say people want to be like, well, I don't have time for that. Well, if you're working virtually or semi-virtually, you're not driving to client appointments anymore. And I love this example. Think about this, folks. If you spend just one hour a day driving to and from your office or to client appointments. And let's face it, we all drove a lot more than that before the, the pandemic. You do that five days a week, 50 weeks a year. That's 250 hours. So do a little bit more math on that. That's four or 6.25 40 hour work weeks. You were sitting in the car doing nothing productive. Right? So you lost all that time. And just so extrapolate that, what if you're in the car two hours a day? Right. I mean, think about how much time months that you were wasting in the car where you could be actually sitting at your desk, creating content and engaging with people at scale. So sorry for the long winded answer, but it, there's there's a real kind of balance there between outsourcing and knowing when to do it uh, if you don't have the, the foundation built correctly at first. Yeah, that foundation I, I find is really important, as you said a couple of slides ago. Uh, throwing money at a problem isn't a solution. You got to have a plan in anything in life. You know, if you want to get in better shape, the people who are more successful are the ones who put a plan together before they just go to the gym. You know, it's, it's longer sustained progress if you have that plan in, in, in place. That, that's exactly right. Actually, what will happen is if you don't have a plan in place and you throw money at something, you will actually compound the problem. You'll right. make it worse. And then you wake up a month or six months later, you spent all this money and time and you're actually further behind than you were before. So put a plan in place. We do it for our clients. We know the, the, how important it is. Put your own plan together, your own roadmap, if you will, so you can start doing all of these things. All right, did you, should we go on to the next bit here? or do we have Yeah, questions? yeah, we'll save some of the questions for the end. Okay, cool, all right. All right, I love this one here. Feel pretty good. And I'm not uh, not scared at all. I just feel kind of feel kind of invincible. Me too. I got a very positive attitude about this. Good, me too. Yeah. Is it getting hot in here or is it just me? Nah, I love that. All right, so at the end of the day, a connector is empowering advisors to feel invincible, just like Jack Burton and all those guys were talking about there. That's what we're trying to do. And it, to define it, what is a system? A system is a comprehensive set of processes that you can set up once and then automate. And that's what the virtual advisor system is. 
Uh, it, and it teaches advisors to that. So obviously, as I said earlier, I am an active advisor. I am a CFP. I am actively working with clients right now. I had a, you know, I've got client meetings every week. So I'm still living this life. So I know what it means to be in the compliance world and all the other challenges that it has to come to be an advisor. Okay. If you want to sum it up, Connector really is, it's lead generation, it's digital marketing, practice management, all bundled together in a comprehensive set of, of systems and processes to help you do what you want to do, to be better advisors, to take advantage of the digital world that we live in. Uh, it's like, you know, also think of it as like a master blueprint. And we talked, Rick, about spending money on this thing or that thing just to hopefully solve it as a problem. And I would say that's just like buying the fixtures for your master bathroom, but yet you don't even have a blueprint, a plan for your house. And that's just backwards. So we have to empower advisors by saying, hey, here's your blueprint. Here's your plan. Here's how you customize it for whatever you want to do. Now go build it. Uh, and that's what we do. We build the business of our dreams. You know, I love to travel. I love to be able to go do all these things I want to do. And that doesn't mean other advisors have to. Maybe you just want to be there for your kids' soccer games. Maybe you want to rebuild that old car. Maybe you want to do more projects on your garden. You know, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. By building a business this way where we can get our time back, reduce our expenses, grow our business, not only are we an amazing example for our clients, but now we're able to be with our families and pursue our own passions and I would say that, that's finding balance. That's how we, how we are able to like live the life we wanna live, but also help our clients do the same. So that's what we're doing at Connector, to sum it up. That's just you know, how we do things, what we do. Um, and these are just that, that, that one piece right there. I love that matrix. I've given that out for free. Anybody can go find that from the Connector um, uh, LinkedIn page. But this is just one of the many things that we teach advisors. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We have advisors right now in the US, Canada, South Africa, and India. We're growing exponentially and just getting a ton of awesome feedback. So I'm very passionate about this. I initially built my virtual system for me just so I could have a better life. A number of advisors asked me how to do it. That was the motivation, inspiration to build Connector so I could help improve the advisor experience. Thanks so much for joining us today for this particular session. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call at 800-206-5030, option three for support, or just shoot us an email over to support at redtailtechnology.com. Thanks a lot and have a great day.